Okay, good evening, everyone. Good evening. So we are up to chapter two in a blueprint of enlightenment, which is beginning on page 73. But some of you might have some questions from the end of chapter one, uh, which may be trailing along that we might want to speak to. I want to also tell you, as I mentioned, Inoue Kondo Roshi is going to be a guest teacher for us uh, at a time in November. We are just beginning to arrange it right now. We have, I have found a translator, Reverend Gilke Yokoyama, a very, very nice Japanese priest who speaks beautiful English, is going to translate for us and he's very excited to do it. And um, I learned also today that Inoue Roshi is very happy to stay with chapter one. As far as he is concerned, everything is in chapter one. It's all there. So we don't have to worry that we haven't, you know, penetrated the book deeply enough. Um, <clears throat> we may come back and reread chapter one again a little bit before we see him, but he is, uh, he says that's the essential talk that he will be doing from that chapter. And he would also appreciate questions ahead of time. And we don't have to do that, but it would be lovely to send him some questions. So please, uh, if you have any questions, email me the questions and then I will forward them to Japan and we'll go from there. And, um, Typically, uh, Japanese are very reticent to ask questions when we are at this kind of venue or when they are sitting before a priest. So they always ask for questions to come ahead of time so that the question per question error, the questionnaire can be the questionnaire, the person who asks the questions can be anonymous. And the Japanese prefer that, but we are very bold Americans and so you could ask a question right at the time, if you should think of one. But I mean, Jerry came up with a great question last week. That was, that was, really, that was really good. That was really uh, you know, straight on. And maybe if you put that into another, uh, into a, a good um, written question, Jerry, I'd like to send that to him. I thought that was really an excellent question. Thank you, I'll, I'll try to do that as the schedule for his, uh, for his um, appearance with us, for his being with us comes closer. Yeah, right, right. Not too much longer because he'll need time. You know, it takes me time for me to get this to the go-between. And the go-between has to translate that into Japanese and then has to send that to Inoue Kondo Roshi. And so there's a lot of trail that takes place. So, you know, at least two weeks ahead of time. Okay, we'll, we'll do, and perhaps you'll be able to help me frame the question. Sure, sure. But that was, a, that was a really good question. Not that other people's questions haven't been good also, but, but that, was a, that was a very good one. That was, uh, and I, I think that we're going to come across that again when we meet with Don Johnson and Buber, because the same thing comes up in a Buber quote that has to do with um, the seed and that the seed remains, even though we have a great opening, the seed remains and continues to push us forward into greater, greater uh, awakenings is, is how Buber applies it. And uh, I'll send you that quote that Don sent me from Buber that, uh, but, but it's the same kind of um, idea that, or notion that we spoke about last week that the bodhicitta doesn't disappear or become the enlightenment, but the bodhicitta seed remains and continues to unfold or continues to lead us toward, toward greater opening. So, <clears throat> so anybody have anything from chapter one that they would like to mention or? I would like to kind of clarify when we were talking about the the sense functions um, being empty 
And one of those was actually mind. The function of mind is only to recognize things. I guess I previously wasn't thinking of that as a sense function or um, one of the five aggregates. So when they are using mind there, is that like the body mind or <laughs> is it just, it is that we're re referencing there? Yes. Not the, not the mind that like defines or conceptualizes things. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. It's the Bodhi mind. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, we all know that, that we have a great deal of thinking that, that we have to do in the course of the day. You know, you, we have to, you know, consider dinner and shopping and our work and the processes of daily life all require us to think. But uh, typically, we probably don't have to think as much as we think we have to think. <laughs> that we can recognize something and we know how to proceed with, with it. So um, as last night we were talking about, um, you know, the question of, uh, of, of, of imagination and worry. And so um, a, a great deal of our thinking is absorbed with worry in the course of a day. For many of us, worry is a, is, is a way of life. Uh, worry about, is this gonna do? Did I get that done? What is next? How will I do this? And uh, that is, uh, you know, in the realm of fantasy. Because once again, uh, as we spoke last night, that worry is, has no resolution to it. So we resolve nothing at all by the fact of worrying and it uses up a tremendous amount of, of energy and, uh, and essentially goes nowhere. So, uh, so we do that kind of thinking that is unnecessary for us, not beneficial at all. And, you know, the question is how we examine the mind or, or consider in the course of a day uh, what ways our consciousness is, is performing or behaving. And so it behooves us to be awake to that, to be awake to whether, whether we've been doing a great deal of that and don't need to or to consider what the quality of life is if we spend our life, uh, spend our days worrying. So um, it's essentially we don't need to think as much as we think we have to. And in some of the ways that we do think uh, ought to be considered and examined and perhaps uh, changed to, to you know, be able to better enjoy life. It really is about enjoy, we should enjoy life. So. Another question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Cynthia, for asking that question. That, uh, that clarified my, my first question, but I have a second question and it is found on the next page, page 70, the last paragraph. He writes, you should save yourself at such a time when all the conditions are in order, shouldn't you? Well, when will I know that all the conditions are in order? <laughs> Jumping right in here, but I, I, I was just um, not, not clear on this idea of conditions ripening and being in order. Well, we know that to do that is the mind that recognizes everything is impermanent. But, you know, I think that here I, the word we think, we say that so much. <clears throat> so perhaps I, I go back to what he might be suggesting is the way in which we uh, take up the most important thing 
is to have a desire to realize the way with all your heart. When we do that deeply in the heart mind, those conditions are in order. We don't have to do much else about that. But all the conditions of life fall into place on that one point of to have the desire to realize the way with all your heart. That very first sentence on page 61. Very first paragraph that he starts out with. And we talked a little bit about that, about how, how do you do that? How do you get to that desire to realize the way with all your heart? I think my, my answer to that is, how much do you want to suffer? Are you ready to stop suffering? And if you are, you realize that you want to turn your heart toward the way that is going to uh, answer these very difficult life questions that we, that we have. So it is no use practicing the way if you don't have this motivation. Without the desire to realize the way, nothing will happen. That completes that paragraph. So this is the condition. This is the question of those conditions are in order. So a, a little story about something about that very thing. So I was in Japan and I was at Ensuji Temple and Inoue Kondo Roshi, who is going to be our visitor, was there. And we were talking about me going into training to be a priest again, to, to be ordained again. And I said to Kondo Roshi that I was going to wait a year because I knew in my own self that I wanted to be debt free. I wanted to work another year in teaching so that I had paid off all my debts and I wouldn't have to worry about it. But he didn't know that. But he said, why, why aren't you going? And I said, I'm going to wait until next year. And he said, I, I don't remember exactly what he said, but you shouldn't put off anything like that. You know, you don't put off something like that. There was, there was that kind of urgency uh, around the, okay, I know that I'm going to do that, but okay, I'll do it next year. And so he had that, he had that uh, urgency for me <laughs> because anything could happen in the year that I wouldn't be able to do that. But, but my purpose was to free myself of all debt so that I would no longer be encumbered by any debts of any kind. And that was the case. And I went deep freely. Uh, so, but, so that was the conditions then in that moment. Inoue Kondo Roshi saw, those, saw the condition in that moment. And I eventually met the condition of being able to free myself to be able to do that completely. And so that was, that was the condition then. All conditions were in order to allow me to go straight ahead. Well, it seems to me that desire needs to be expressed in action. I mean, desire can be wishful thinking. It can sure. be right. sincere intentions. Right. But I can only see my desire being manifest through my practice at this point. Right, right, right. that's right, yeah. Okay. You know, um, June, our dear June, um, it's okay. Uh, she was famous for shoulda, shoulda, coulda, doulda. Shoulda, coulda, woulda, shoulda, what is it? Coulda, shoulda. Woulda. Woulda, <laughs> woulda, yeah, thank you. <laughs> June was very famous and she was very articulate about being the queen of of um, would have, and um, we don't want to be that. We we don't want to be the should I should have and could have, 
and would have. We don't want to get there. Don't want to be that. Don't allow that. Don't allow that in one's life. That is if there's something that we can't do that we might want to be very clear about it. Be very clear that so that um, we don't encumber ourselves with uh, regret, dis self disappointment, or, or any of those things that block us from moving forward in a clear way. That was, I think that was also what Kondo Roshi said to me, never disappoint yourself. You shouldn't disappoint yourself. Meaning anything could happen in this year and you're not gonna get to go next year. So, but it worked out okay for me. So <laughs> it was. Edo-san, I, um, I, I, I read something um, into this, uh, not contrary to what you said at all, but just maybe in, in addition to it. If, if, you, uh, if you kind of take the theme starting at the bottom of the previous page, it talks about how difficult it is to be born as a human being. Yes. And once you are born as a human being, then you've got the same tools that, uh, that Shakyamuni Buddha had and the ancestors had. And so then when he asked the question, um, you should save yourself at such a time when all the conditions are in order, shouldn't you? I, I took that shouldn't you and kind of harkened back to the couple paragraphs before we read it as you, 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 you're, you're born now, you've got all the tools now, all the conditions are in order, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. You definitely can say, look at it that way, indeed. I mean, another way we could say that the conditions are always, are always ready, are always clear. This is what, is, what do you want to give up or what are you able to give up uh, is another thing. I mean, you know, I, I look around our group here and, you know, when I see married men with children and uh, families and so forth. Oh, so you know, you can't walk away from that, nor should you. Because that's your practice. And that I had the same situation in my life is that I was raising three children and I could not leave. I couldn't leave my family. I would, couldn't walk away from my children. They needed to be raised and cared for. So that is, that is one's true practice and one's complete practice in those conditions. And at the same time, all conditions are removed for you to practice clearly with that. It's only in our head that we are carrying some of those ideas about whether one's practice is pure or, or complete. But um, at the same time, uh, we can be in that situation and still block ourselves from practice just by all kinds of decisions that we make that, that keep us from practice. So um, save yourself at such a time, you should save yourself at such a time when all the conditions are in order. Let's put that down. Would somebody record that as a question for Inoue Kondo Roshi? <laughs> somebody here because I can't write it right now. I will. <laughs> but that, that is a good question. Uh, so, so what does that mean? to have the conditions in order? It's a good question, but that's my take on it. But, uh, and then Amir offered another angle on that. And there could be many other ways to see that. So. So, um, <clears throat> but you know, to go back on that, Um, it is the mind that recognizes everything is impermanent. The feeling that you could die at any moment. So, um, you know, he, he, we are going to meet that again in the next chapter that, um, you know, carpe diem. Um, don't put everything off. Don't put everything off. So no coulda, shoulda, woulda, dooda. <laughs> I keep saying that again. Coulda, woulda, shoulda. <laughs> so, um, I think when I first read that, I was making a, a distinction between universal conditions and personal conditions. Um, mm. I'm reminded of that, that phrase and the Sandokai, the, the spiritual 
source, spiritual sh source shines clear in the light, the branching streams flow on in the dark. Right. It's always there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those conditions. So, so, so that's true. So at any moment we can, we, you know, it's our choice to, uh, to be conscious. And so that, that is clearly available to us every single day. And maybe I, I have, you know, so many requirements in my life that I have to meet. At the same time, I can be conscious and not resentful about them and uh, not feel that I, that, you know, that, that my life is miserable because I have these. Uh, I, I can choose my attitude and I can choose to lift myself up by the selfless action of completing those. So, um, yes, yes. I have a question. Yes, Joan. Um, I'm still stuck on this one phrase by Dogen, which is on page 59, where he says, um, when freed from the bondage of sound, color, and shape, you will naturally become one with the true Bodhi mind. I, I'm having a hard time seeing sound, color, and shape as bondage. Um, so I'm not sure what he means by that. Well, here again, I think that uh, when we went into the discussion is somebody there yeah when we went into the point of the commentary once again it's this question of being uh, allowing the function of these senses to to simply be the function itself and not uh not going forward with the ego or or ruled by the ego so 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 this is it if we are uh, as Gian Roshi says, if we are operating with these sense senses of sound color and shape via our own convenience, via the ego, then we are in bondage. So when we are free from that bondage of sound, color, and shape, we'll naturally become one with the true Bodhi mind. It's pretty simple, actually. But it is also the function of mind to see color, but not to try to reshape it or, or to discriminate or to, uh, you know, revile color or to uh, try to change it in some way. It just is as it appears. Sound, color, and shape. I mean, many of us work with the problem of, of sound, that we don't like the sounds that come into the body. Uh, there's a guy next door who runs a four-wheeler around at certain times, and it's pretty excruciating when he does that. And so it, it um, you know, that's, that's really, it's to feel like you are in bondage to the sound because you can't turn, you can't get away from it, and it's just a screeching, terrible sound. And so, um, how, you know, am I in the midst of that when, when he does that, when that occurs? Not very good. I'm not very good with that. It's pretty, pretty uh, stunning and uh, pretty painful, actually. So that's a kind of bondage then. What if it's a pleasant sound? What if it's music? Oh, you should enjoy music. That's perfectly wonderful. Of course, of course, you should enjoy music. But how is that bondage? 
What is that, the bondage that is, of sound on that? Is, because the question is how you how you hear and how you listen, not the fact that the music is there. You know, the 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 problem is if you are listening with your ego and uh, either critiquing it in such a way or um, reviling it or uh, you know selfishly listening, that's one thing. But to listen to music, we, we would die if we didn't have music in, in the human experience. We, we, would, we would starve. We, we would die of starvation. <laughs> so uh, it, it, music is essential. When the critical mind comes in, when, it, when you're interacting with color, shape or sound, it seems like if it's the critical or judgmental mind that comes in, then it's bondage. Yes. But yes. if it's just yes. coming in a more pure sense, uh, without that sort of, I don't know, intellectual overlay, if you will, then it's not bondage. Is that kind of what you I, mean? That's how I would take it, Joan. That, that would be, unless yes. somebody has anything else to say in that way. But that, that is how I would take it. And I mean, those are some, that's a, that's a heavy translation there, no doubt about it. And please bear in mind that we're always working with a translation and choice of words that come from one translator. I am going to check, I have another translation of this, and I'm going to check out and see what language is used on that. And I will get back to you next week on that. Because that, that word bondage um, freed from the bondage is, it's a big, big word. So I'm going to see how that sentence translates when somebody else takes it. Yeah, it, it seems a little heavy handed for some things to say, to use that word bondage seems a little yeah. heavy handed. But on the other hand, I mean, we are bound by the ego in that sense. And um, you know, the issue that we discover in this one is how we free ourselves from the, the constraints of ego and allow ourselves to, to free, live freely. When I, um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Amir. I, I, well, I was, I was thinking, just... <laughs> please, please go ahead, sorry. <laughs> I was thinking, Joan, about flower uh, arranging and because shape came into this and I was thinking, um, I, I don't arrange flowers, but I can imagine wanting to arrange flowers in such a way that the flowers become uh, as much of themselves as they can be. And, you know, like we have this relationship as you arrange them, I suppose with the flowers, but you want the essence of them to show. And there must be some process that happens or lack of process that you go through in arranging them to do that in a way that allows them to be their fullest self um, without our getting in the way of that. So, so I was just thinking about shape and, and color and your own particular skill set in flower arranging, and that's what popped into my head. That's a good one, Karen. Very, very nice. Uh, because, uh, I mean, something does happen in the process of arranging flowers because you know that what happens if your ego intercepts that arrangement, it can't. It, it, the aesthetic itself is what must come forward. And so the job is to move your ego out of the way and allow the true uh, expression and you, you just to simply happen, to allow the intuitive eye to give those flowers their full share, their full beauty. And I can hardly wait until we can all get together and we can get Joan down here to do a flower arranging course for us. Because she's so good. <laughs> so. Yes. Like well, 
well, on, I, that, on that same theme of uh, flower arranging, I mean, there's the practice of kado, which is the way of flowers. You're actually working with color and shape and everything in nature as not bondage at all, but a path to liberation. Of course. So, I, I have to argue with Dogen on this point. I really don't. Of course we use color. I mean, ask Allison, the painter. But, but there is a way of harmony. I think that you will agree that there is a way of harmony in flower arranging, in the use of color. And so Dogen would never object to, to such a thing. So uh, of course we use color, and of course we use sound, and of course we use, uh, what else did he call here, shape. Of course. Well, I interpreted bondage um, along with the old Buddhist idea of attraction and repulsion or Yeah, attractive, attraction and repulsion. I see this or I hear this, I like that, give me more of it, I, I, want, I want it, I want it. I hear or I see and I don't like that, get it away from me. So that you're constantly um, pulled back and forth. That's what's meant by conflicting motions in the text and so if we in the words of Xin Chen Ming avoid picking and choosing just you open your eyes you see it you don't you can choose <laughs> um, that that I, I thought I, that's how I interpreted it oh. old old Buddhist teaching quite right Mickey Quite right. It's the picking, that's the simple thing. Everything would be fine if we just don't pick and choose. So, yeah. Anyway, I will get, a, I will get uh, another uh, translation of that for you, Joan, to see if it changes the, your, the uh, reception of it. So, okay. Anything else, anybody from? Oh, if I could, if I could just add, <clears throat> just one thing, I think I, a word that I haven't heard used is um, uh, associations. I think the more associations we layer onto the sound, the shape, that's when we're getting in the way. And so if we can just see it for what it is, that with less associations, then, then the beauty, the harmony of itself emerges. So there, yeah, I think there's no conflict. We certainly use the shapes and the sound, but we use, the, we're the conduit that it helps them emerge and we stay out of the way. Yeah, that's a good one, uh, the associations, uh, Jason, because, uh, we, you know, we, we are inclined to immediately do that, associate one thing with another and compare, constantly compare. So that's a, that's a good thing to remind us of. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, let's go to page uh, 73. This begins chapter two, the need for training upon encountering the true law. And this is almost not worthy of being called a full chapter. It's two short paragraphs that Dogen wrote, Dogen Zenji wrote, and um, so it's, a, it's a, just a very brief commentary. And when you read this, it feels like reading something from the I Ching. At least it does for me. So a king's mind can, offer, can often be changed as a result of advice given by a, royal, a loyal re retainer. Just like something you hear in the I Ching. Cast the, cast the uh, coins and this comes up in the trigram. So essentially we are being told that, you know, it's rare for somebody also to um, truly listen to the Buddha's words. Exceptional trainees listen to the Buddha's words. And also um, 
<clears throat> that it's impossible to sever the source of transmigration without casting away the de delusive mind. In the same way, if a king fails to heed the advice of his retainers, virtuous policy will not prevail and he will be unable to govern the country well. Well, as we <laughs> daily see. <laughs> we easily resonated with that sentence, did we not? <laughs> so, uh, so this is the case. And it, it also sounds very Confucian, Confucian teaching. Um, Dogen Zenji was a Confucius, Confucian scholar, but also uh, the, the uh, Japanese society is a Confucian society. It's the teachings in, that we find in Confucianism are the regulations, the values of how the society stays in order. So this, um, you know, one of the aspects of uh, the Confucian teaching then is that, that the king or the ruler is benevolent and then oversees the uh, the statesmen then who are also benevolent toward the citizens and then the father is benevolent to the mother and the mother is benevolent to the children and the children the eldest takes care of the next and the next and the next and so that is the order of society and um, then also is the prescription then if the king or the emperor or the ruler is not benevolent or not heedful, then everything else in the society falls apart. And so we are certainly seeing that even though we don't have a king, we have somebody who would, you know, maybe a would-be king, but uh, is not a king. And uh, we certainly are in the midst of a person who is in charge, but is unable to heed the advice of his retainers, of anybody around him. And so virtuous policy will not prevail and he will be unable to govern the country well. So it's pretty, pretty straightforward. And as Mickey says, we are seeing that exactly. And so um, the need for training upon encountering the true law is the title of this. And so Immediately, Gyan Roshi says, it is necessary to practice in order to know the true Dharma, the way of being most intimate with yourself. This is the clearest way to liberate yourself. That's essentially the, the uh, chapter. Um, Gyan Roshi elucidates on this and, you know, takes a few sentences out of Dogen's uh, language and then speaks to it, but um, essentially we, we come back once again to if you really feel intimate with yourself, then certainly it's true that if the Buddhas and patriarchs offer even a single word, there will be none who will remain unconverted. So if that is so, I, I, felt a, I, I felt a little bit of conflict in this, in that he first says that if the Buddhas and patriarchs offer even a single word, there will be none who will remain unconverted. And the Buddhas and uh, patriarchs have indeed done that. So why then are only exceptional trainees those who listen to the Buddha's words? So is Dogen saying that we have been converted, but we don't know it and we don't recognize it? What do you think about that? I mean, I, I thought that that was uh, something to pull out. Are we actually converted, but don't recognize it? And unable to listen to the Buddha's words? I, I do think he's saying saying that and something like that. And um, so the, the, the single word is offered, but but you have to you have to hear it. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 I thought of the um, 
the very end of Genjo Koan when the when the when the two monks are talking about you know the the nature of air and and one is and the the master is fanning himself and so the the the, the nature of air is the, is the word but you've got to You've got to fan yourself. You've got to do the training in order to realize it. Right. That's right. Yep. We have to train. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, practice is the outcome of the realization of of enlightenment. We sit because we are enlightened. <laughs> and do we really know that we are? Do we really recognize it? Do we really? Um, are, are we really aware that that is our that is our condition? That is our true deep condition. But, um, but this, Edison, yes, is, is training used here synonymous with practice, or is is training? Does he mean formal taking the robe? Um, monks training. No, you are tr you are in training. You, you don't have to be a monk to be in training. We're all in training. Lay people are in, we're all in constantly in training. Your whole day is in training. And every time we come to the Zendo, we're in training. And so it never stops. And so I, th I think that the word training was retained in this because uh, we, we, there was some disagreement with the translation of Dogen's language that was translated in a certain way. And then Daigaku's translation of the commentary so we've got two translations going on here. And um, the one word that was taken out is the word Buddhism, because Buddhism now we refer to as practice. So that word was changed, but I think training, training is lifelong for all of us. And so that, that word remains the same. You do not have to be a priest to be in training. And priest training is very specific stuff, but priest training is, does exactly the same thing as lay people do in the Zendo. What we do in the Zendo is not different from what any priest does in training. It's exactly the same. And the, when you take a, receive a rakasu, the keichi miyaku that you get, the papers of the, that are actually the transmission are exactly the same as a priest receives. There's no difference between a priest and a lay person. Now, if somebody is taking priest vows, they will be required to do much more elaborate and focused kinds of trainings that lay people don't do, or don't necessarily do, but could do. So, uh, so there's no difference. I mean, uh, you know, a priest is trained to carry the rituals and the, the, the deep uh, uh, esoteric rituals of, of the religion. And so this is something that lay people do not do. But we're all in training. I'm in training. Could it be said that by extension, every moment actually is training? Um, I mean, when you wake up in the morning, when you get out of bed, the whole, the whole day is training. And I think that as I, as I say that, the, um, I think it's really helpful and maybe even necessary to talk about training in a specific way, for instance, in Zazen, um, and the pra formal practice that we do, say in the Zendo or sitting at home, because that kind of centers you in what, what the training really is for the rest of the day. I don't know if you, um, is, is that understandable or? Yes, of course. Okay. Mm -hmm. At least for me, it kind of opens it up in a, in a really wonderful way that we're never, we really are never not training. I mean, you know, maybe, maybe life is in training to have a good death. 
I, I don't, you know. But, but clearly training is to live clearly, to live well, to live consciously. Right. And that requires every day, every work every day. There's a truism in hospice that people die the way they lived. And I can see that, um, you know, if you've fretted a great deal through your whole life around this question of your death, that's going to continue all the way through your death. And you see that in people's dying, mm -hmm. where they are, uh, that anxiety continues through the whole course of their dying, um, as opposed to practicing around that question and finding some resolution around it prior to the process unfolding. Yeah. Well, I, I recall at, when Joan Halifax came here, uh, she did uh, a weekend seminar with us and a hundred people came to this, this uh, weekend with her. And so we were all assembled. We, we did it over at the uh, Unitarian Universalist Church because we couldn't possibly have a hundred people here. But in any event, uh, the question came up is, uh, how, how do you want to die? You know, what, what that last moment, like where do you want to be and how do you, how do you want that to be? And it was, it was so interesting the way people responded to that. Jikyo, our Jikyo stood up immediately and she says, I want to die immediately under a tree. <laughs> Just like that. It was great. <laughs> and then a bunch of people said, oh no, I want to be lying down in bed with my family around me holding hands. <laughs> Everybody had some uh, other kind of way that was most interesting about how they wanted to die. And it is exactly that, Karen, it was very much about how they, how they're personalities were in some way, um, how, they, how they were going to choose to die, yeah. That's why I think it's so important to normalize conversation around that. Yeah. Because the more comfortable everyone is talking about it, yeah. the more um, opportunities we have before the final moments to, um, you know, just relax into it more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, it's, he's going to say down in here on page, you know, the next page, it's just like pissing. It's, it's as simple as that. It's like taking a piss and suddenly it came to him. What? Can we be satisfied with such a great problem as birth and death just by considering them in the same light as pissing? And I said, yes, it is possible. Anyone can do it. It's already that way right now. You just don't know it. And I, I said this last week, I used that word pissing, if you remember last week on the recording and it went out. <laughs> and it will again this week. And so Brad received a, a text from a friend of his who had listened to it, or he, had, he wrote this little sign that says, Pissing is a drink. <laughs> uh, the recording can't hear everybody laughing, but I can see everybody laughing. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, but it's that simple. It's, is, you know, as we say, uh, zazen is as simple as washing your face. So uh, dying is also that simple. And if we can make it that way, and the allowance, allowing ourselves to let go of all of the luggage we've been carrying along and to step into awakening in a sense, to allow it to just wash over us is maybe the same as dying Some, in a similar way, that we just let go. Because certainly when we let go, we're probably not going to die, but we just let go of the, of the luggage, of the associations, of the, you know, the, the, the arguments and the fights and the, all of it that we've been carrying along. We just let go. 
And so that is, I think, what Roshi is suggesting. It's that simple. I mean, he says a little bit further back up at the page on 74. Um, <clears throat> if we do not put the Buddha's words into practice, as it is taught, then you're like a stone in water unable to swim. You won't be able to raise your head. You will not be liberated. You know, and I think that I think that in a lot of ways, our heads are also full of the Buddha's words. They are full of all of the readings that we have done and some of it becomes too much. So what words do we begin with? What, what word is it that you can take, that you can examine then in, in its great depth that will allow the Buddha's teachings to unfold for you and not devour too much of it. You know, I, I um, wonder where we go for solace. What words of the Buddha do you pick for solace? When you need some kind of solace, you're bereft and things are so tough and difficult. Well, what do you go to? We should try and find that in the Buddha's words. What, what is it that you, what words of the Buddha do you rely on? So I suggest, uh, you, you know, searching out the text or becoming very quiet with it and finding out what, what particular teaching can you truly uh, throw yourself into in order to have it so or have it completely open up in you. We, we must have a resting place. We have to have a place where we rest a little bit and and we uh, you know allow the allow ourselves to just be. So what's the single word? Even a single offer, even if the Buddhists and patriarchs often offer even a single word. What is what are the words of the Buddha that are yours? I don't know if these are technically the Buddha's words, but I know whenever I get like anxious or scared to do something, I kind of just remind myself, like I say over and over, like comforting embrace, comforting embrace. And I just take it slowly and I try to feel out what comforting feels like to me and what embrace feels like to me. And I just you know, kind of remind myself that I'm here for me and that it's, I'm here for myself with a comforting embrace and it allows me to kind of re recenter myself and feel solace. Well, that, that I am gl very glad that you have that, Daniel. That, y you know, we are embraced by the Buddha and, and the Buddha is a great comforter and means to be so. 
So that, that is very wonderful that you have that. And as we repeat those uh, kinds of words to ourselves, it really does bring us to, a, to where we're okay. We can be okay. And we can get through just about anything. Constant mindfulness of sound observer. That is the same kind of thing in the Lotus Sutra where we are taught that constant mindfulness of sound observer will get us through the most awful excruciating difficulties. And that is, you know, a comforting embrace. That's what mind, the constant mindfulness of sound observer is, comforting embrace. I'm very glad you have that. You know, I have mentioned that there are, there are saints who have just studied one or two words their entire life. I told you about Teresa of Avila, who, was it Teresa of Avila or, yeah, it was Teresa of Avila, who, um, two words her entire life she meditated on, our father. Just our father. And she never could get past the enormity of that. The first of the hour, meaning the non, all of us, the non-separation. And then father, the incredible qualities of, of the father and what that means. And she spent her whole life on those two words, meditation. Just deeper and deeper, getting into it deeper and deeper. So, um, just a thought, you know, about how to take that need for training upon encountering the true law. Well, everybody's becoming, become very quiet with this. Should we leave it that tonight? That's a big practice to find what those words are for you. And it's a, it's a very solitary uh, kind of thing because uh, we each have to delve very deeply into the text or, or into something or an image or whatever it is to find out what, what belongs to us or what avenue we each can take. It's going to be different for each one. So, but, but the issue is to how do we, how do we uh, you know, dive into, well, on our, you know, into the soul of the matter? How do we dive deeply into it and uh, know that, you know, when, uh, you know, all things are, uh, are on fire and everything is terrible, uh, we, we're okay. I wish for everybody that kind of solace. I think that practice should be, allow us that. I think that, uh, I think that the Buddha means that. I mean, I, I don't think the Buddha means to, uh, to abandon us uh, at any moment. So it's Buddha's our true teacher and our true friend. So how do we know the Buddha? <laughs> how do we recognize the Buddha? <laughs> I, I think it, we're all quiet on this, and I think I think uh, we could stay quiet for this evening and not try and talk too much now.
as anybody has a question at all, but I, I think it's good. I think it's a really good deep moment to leave you with. I feel the, I feel that it's uh, an, an important search. Maybe we'll read up to page 83 for next time. To midway on 84, that's what we'll do. Well, my friends, you know we are in treacherous times, so you must uh, you know, find out what your prayer is. I, I, that's kind of how I mean it. I mean, Daniel, Daniel shared with us his prayer, and uh, all of practice is a prayer. And yet, what, what do we each go to for our prayer? So, all right. Beings are numberless, I vow to save them. Delusions are inexhaustible, I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless, I vow to enter them. Buddha's way is unsurpassed, I vow to become it.